show on the Remnant Radio called To Be Continued. Welcome to our new... We're live. You guys know that, right? We're live right now? Oh, I didn't know that. (laughs) Hey, everybody. Welcome to Remnant Radio. Uh, This is our new show called To Be Continued. We're going to be discussing the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, If you can't tell, uh, we've got myself in studio. We have Michael Roundtree and... Michael Miller, all the way from Colorado. <laughs> what is that? I like that pose. It's tasteful. It's uh, the 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 smolder, I'm, or is it the blue steel? Blue what steel. are you drinking there, blue Miller? Steel. I'm working That's on my right. blue steel. What are you drinking there? That's just uh, a little cup of Joe. I hope so. So this is a cup of single origin from Corvus Coffee here, local in Denver, Colorado. Uh, hey. They don't sponsor me, but maybe they will. I should ask. <laughs> well, we're always looking for sponsors, so uh, reach out. Anyway, uh, this is a new podcast uh, that we're doing. It's a new, it's kind of a test that we're doing. We're going to be doing this indefinitely, but uh, hopefully it picks up some steam. We're going to be doing a weekly show on the gifts of the Spirit. So uh, we are still doing our two shows on Monday and Tuesday, interviewing pastors and teachers. But uh, this week on Wednesday, this day on uh, every week on Wednesday, uh, we're going to be discussing the gifts of the Spirit. Hopefully we will be doing teachings on the gifts. We will be doing... Uh, kind of argumentations of cessationism and kind of dismantling those. And uh, we're going to be talking about the excesses of the gifts of the Spirit. So we're going to kind of be calling balls and strikes and trying to help the body of Christ is there's a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of abuse, uh, and, and not a whole lot of really healthy teaching on YouTube, though there's books and books and volumes and volumes and tons of scholars who are smarter than us. So we're just going to try to put it in YouTube format for the masses. Yes. So today is just going to be kind of a primer uh, on that. Yeah, and it's uh, it's not an interview format. This is just like you guys watching a conversation and uh, Michael Miller joining us, a former co-host uh, of Remnant Radio and a good friend of ours. And so uh, it's going to be the three of us and we're, uh, we're just going to be talking about it. Michael, Michael Miller and I kind of grew up in the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the same church together. So you'll hear more about that here shortly. Um, uh, before we dive deeper into the episode, episode, though, I want to just kind of let you guys know, those of you who are interested in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, uh, specifically, we do on our interview format, our typical format of Remnant Radio. Next week, we have an episode coming up called Getting Ghosty with Augustine. That's right. Yeah. Or Augustine, whatever your preference is. So, but either way, we're going to be getting ghosty with him, whatever Mm -hmm. that means. We're going to be talking about his view of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which evolved as we'll see. And we'll have Matthew Esquivel on the show. And uh, we've just done a lot of episodes, a lot of interviews on this. Uh, Maybe you saw our uh, prophetic marathon that we did on New Year's Eve. We did, uh, just before that, uh, episodes on misconceptions about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So, uh, in fact, you can go into our YouTube channel, and it's uh, it's categorized by gifts of the Holy Spirit. You can just go, and you can click on that category and unload tons of interviews. Uh, but like I said here, this episode, to be continued, is, uh, is specifically not an interview format, more of a conversation. Uh, so, hey, uh, Michael, since it's been about a year since uh, since you've really, I mean, been one of the hosts on the show, just give us like a, a 30 second intro to yourself. I know we've interviewed you before, but just kind of re-intro yourself for those who aren't familiar with you. Okay, Michael, can you hear us? Yeah, man, your audio has cut out. Did you mute yourself? Yeah, you did. I think it... Yeah, I we, I pressed the we, unmute Michael, button, we I, can't, I'm learning, I'm learning. We can't fix you pushing mute. Like there's no tech solution for that. <laughs> Thank you. Unmute your mic. You're a professional. <laughs> All right. My 30 seconds are up. <laughs> tell us, uh, Michael, tell uh, us yourself about your, yourself and your ministry, bro. Yeah. So, um, I'm here in Denver, Colorado talking from my basement, uh, the studio, which Josh was just installed here a week ago. Um, so I, I moved out here back in February, 2019, or sorry, February, 2020. This is my second time. Well, third time I actually moved to Colorado. Uh, but here I'm, I'm now here to stay. I'm never leaving again. God help me <laughs> and God willing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I came here to plant a church and, and plant my family. And so I've got two kids, uh, I've been married now for seven and a half years. I got a four year old and a two year old. And um, we have a church called Reclamation Church. We meet inside of a, another facility called Hope Church over in Platte Park area, of Denver, Colorado. And so we do a Tuesday night meeting um, uh, at 6 p.m. with dinner and then followed by a sort of your normal service. 
So okay, that's it. Awesome. Well, Michael, we'll be hearing more from you here in a little bit. What we'd like to do today is just an introductory episode is for the three of us to each kind of take turns and tell a little bit of our story about coming into the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There's some similarities, there's some differences, and uh, and I'm going to go first, Josh pick it apart, interrupt me, Michael, same thing with you, just like friends hanging out. So, um, but I'm just going to tell you guys my story for starters, uh, hey, because I, before yeah. you jump in, uh, maybe I mean, should, when I said interrupt I, me, I wasn't talking about yet before he gets started. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just thinking, uh, part of the reason I think this show in particular to be continued is, is going to be a helpful show to have, um, pertains to the very vision that Josh had with uh, remnant radio to begin with. And so maybe, Josh, you could speak to that. Why did you call it the Remnant Radio? What was its main focus? And how does this show in particular contribute to that conversation? Sure. So Remnant uh, is the idea that there is a leftover group. There's a group leftover um, that they want more uh, in the theology chosen space. chosen by grace. They want more elected of, before time. That's what it meant. Uh, yeah, so so I, I I viewed it as this. There's a there's a group of people inside of every single denomination, right? Um, uh, that are not necessarily satisfied with the denominational norms. Um, to say, uh, for example, I was raised in classical Pentecostal churches, um, and it was always like, man, there's just this this side of the Christian faith, whether it be history and theology, that I don't feel like I have access to, and I can't really buck up against my system. Uh, though I, I respect my system and I love it, I, I really want to. I want to learn more. And I feel like there's a group of people in every single church, uh, some people that, man, they just want to learn more about the gifts and some churches that want to learn more about history and more about theology. And uh, I think that there are lots of people who are looking for conversation outside of their theological echo chamber. And we wanted to be able to provide a space for us to have those kinds of conversations. All right. So awesome. And you even, there was even like a prophetic sort of vision that kind of introduce this whole thing to you in some measure, right? Yeah, or well, uh, kind of early on. Yeah, so uh, Jeff Gray was our first co-host on Remnant Radio. So Jeff uh, was a, a barber by trade, but was a pastor in Seattle for like nine years, came down because of, uh, frankly, some charismatic abuse, um, moved back down to the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, and uh, he was at our church. Uh, my buddy Matthew uh, Tarpley had introduced me to Jeff just momentarily before because he had also come from a similar background. He comes up to me uh, in the altars and asks for prayer. I'm praying for him, and uh, I get a word for him that uh, the Lord moved him back down to do media ministry, uh, maybe radio. I saw a microphone. I was just kind of explaining to him that. It's like, does this make sense to you? Is this something that you're passionate about? And he's like, well, yeah, actually, I did radio for a few years while I was in Seattle. I was really passionate about it. I felt bad about leaving it. I would love to continue to do something like that. So uh, I took him upstairs to a space I was looking about doing a podcast with, and as he had been a former pastor, and I was interested in having conversations on theology, uh, we just started having the conversation. Uh, and from that moment of prayer, we ended up starting Remnant Radio in uh, a closet upstairs in the balcony of my church that had acoustic foam falling off the walls. Uh, <laughs> episode one was gross. It was gross. It was not good. It's always know. gross. I remember I remember going and doing the first few podcasts there, too. Were yeah. you grossed out? Uh, well, I, it was the funny thing was it was the roof was like just right here above your head. And I remember when yeah. we had Matt Chandler come in, he was literally having to duck down to walk He's in tall. and crawl into the... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> to the studio. Yeah, I could I could touch the lights from sitting down. I could I could adjust the lights while sitting. That were that were. There's in a the convenience ceiling. to that though. Yeah, absolutely. It's quite nice. <laughs> right. So, um, anyway, so I'll jump in with my story. You guys feel free to ask a question, Miller. If you could let me get like 30 seconds or more in before the interruption, <laughs> that'd be great. But um, so I grew up uh, not really going to church. And I, I got saved uh, pretty dramatically when I was 17 years old. A, a drinking buddy of mine invited me to church, and uh, I heard the gospel really fully preached for the first time. And um, and uh, and actually, uh, even after that, I, I guess the, the gospel was preached. I, I mean, I was already responding, but then when the worship music uh, began, that's when I really encountered the Holy Spirit. Uh, for the first time. And that, that's all like, it's almost a, a blur, but uh, that was where my conversion really happened. And I just remember uh, telling myself, if if God is this amazing, uh, I want to live for him for the rest of my life. And uh, and so I gave my life to Jesus uh, right there. And, uh, and, and I just had this really powerful encounter with the Holy Spirit. And, and so gospel was preached, Holy Spirit was present, 
people getting saved. I mean, that was all awesome. At the same time, it was a church. It was a denomination that was uh, very Pentecostal, and uh, they certainly, um, well, they were very open in their practice of the gifts. And uh, in the middle of that meeting, even though I was experiencing God in all of this, there was also a lot of craziness going on. And uh, I remember people loudly uh, speaking in tongues all around the room. And you got to keep in mind, I was in a, before that, like did not know Jesus, had never read my Bible, didn't even know what speaking in tongues was. So like never even had heard the term yet at 17 years old. So you imagine with that kind of grid coming in and what you hear is, and I'm like, what is going on? So I actually like conversion is always a miracle, but miracle upon miracles is that I was converted in a setting such as that where I was like, I don't know what's going on. And yet at the same time, I experienced the Lord. So it was like in the midst of the mess and in the midst of the crazy, the Lord was still there. They just weren't controlling the crazy. And so, um, I kept going back and I was hearing more gospel and I was getting more passionate about Jesus. I was reading my New Testament. I, I grew like crazy uh, in that church. And yet at the same time, even as a new believer, when I got to the chapters in 1 Corinthians 14, for instance, where it's like, you know, there needs to be order and how this is practiced. And I, even early on as a believer, no one's even teaching me about this. I'm thinking, this doesn't seem quite right. I'm experiencing God here. I'm getting instructed and edified here. These are good people who really love Jesus, but this is some crazy stuff. And uh, and so I continued to grow there throughout like that kind of last year of high school. I went off to college, and I put on the Holy Spirit seatbelt. And I, I went to a Baptist church, uh, didn't believe in all that stuff, but it was really good people, really good. They were cessationist. Uh, it was very highly reformed. There was, you know, it was like, you know, John Piper, everybody's reading all of his books. And I got steeped in theology, steeped in Bible, memorized a gazillion verses, got super discipled, a really solid church. And that's, you know, part of the reason why I don't, I don't have animosity towards cessationists. I'm not like you heathen cessationists. You're so stupid or anything like that. Um, because man, uh, I was discipled in a cessationist church and really grew in powerful ways. And they experienced the power of the Holy Spirit too. Um, it looks different and, uh, you know, but the Holy Spirit, uh, empowers, empowered my sanctification there greatly. Um, I felt called to ministry at that time. I was at the university of Texas in Austin, got a finance degree and, uh, actually finished out with that finance degree was falling in love. My kind of junior, senior year I was getting married right at the end of my senior year. And, uh, and I was, I knew I was called into ministry and, um, and so we're engaged, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go into ministry soon, planning to go to seminary right after college, all of this. And, um, and then my, uh, fiance at the time has a confession for me and she's like, sets it up. Like, this is going to be a big confession. And I'm like, oh dang, like, <laughs> like we had never done this before. Like what, what is it? Like, do you do crack on the side? Uh, I mean, are you two timing me? Like what's going on? <laughs> and uh, I'm sure it was the crack. Was, <laughs> I mean, crack. Well, <laughs> she's watching this, Michael. <laughs> as it turns uh, out, her confession was she spoke in tongues, dun, dun, which dun. was actually as bad as two timing me or smoking crack. So, <laughs> not, yeah, yeah. not really. But same thing. You know, even even as far as the gifts were concerned, though, like of all the gifts, if she was like, I. I heal people or, you know, or God uses me to heal people or I prophesy or whatever, you know, that would have been maybe even a little easier to, to, to stomach. But, you know, by this point, I'll be honest, I, I wasn't like full fledged cessationist. I was just like, I was just content for that part of the world to exist somewhere else. Like, you know, um, 98, 90 AD, or, um, maybe even in Africa, mm -hmm. but certainly not here. And certainly not now, as long as it's somewhere else, I'm good because I'd experienced charismatic craziness. And, uh, while there were good things that happened, 
Um, I felt much more rooted in this church and in the way God had uh, sanctified me in my walk with Christ uh, in that church. And and I was ready to, to go preach the gospel and be a cessationist preacher, uh, and, and I was comfortable with that. But this forced me to a decision. And uh, by the way, that was a really big argument that we had, and I can fill you in later on if you have questions. But um, well, you're married now, so I kind of get <laughs> I probably know where that one ended. So it, she won. She she won. So this yeah. was this was really what happened prophetic next of all was of the arguments you were going to. What happened next is she actually started speaking in tongues, and I got an interpretation. Not really. I made oh, that. Damn, up. I made that geez. up. I made that up. So well, hey, um, that's that's pretty much my wife's story. <laughs> okay, that's well, we'll true. get to yours. She does. She does get interpretation. Yeah. So um, anyway, but I, I just, that put me on a journey of like, okay, I, I need to actually figure out and make a decision for myself. And honestly, it's good for me anyway. Like if I'm going to be a pastor of a church, I need to know what I think about this. And I need to know it from the scripture, not just based on, um, you know, some experiences of some ab- abuse or misuse. I'll probably put it in the category of misuse. Uh, I don't want to base my theology on someone else's misuse, nor do I want to base my theology on my last four years of college of uh, lack of use, call it neglect. I want to base it on the scripture. And so I did a deep dive into the book of Acts. I did deep dives into the relevant uh, passages of scripture. And I began reading books by people. And uh, one of those books was by Jack Deere. And he had a, uh, two of them, Surprised by the Power of the Spirit, Surprised by the Voice of God. And, uh, and, I, and I picked these books up because I found that he had uh, come from a background I was familiar with, Dallas Theological Seminary. This guy's a theologian. He's a Bible guy. And um, I didn't want to just read books by more charismatic, crazy people because that's not where I wanted to go. And I and I read the I read his books and uh, and he had all the stories. I mean, the miracles, the power, the voice of God, encounters, all the stuff that you see in the pages of the New Testament. Uh, and yet it was steeped in Bible, steeped in theology. And there's this beautiful marriage between Word and Spirit. And uh, and I said a little prayer. And this is my senior year of college, 22 years old. And I just said a little prayer, Lord. Um, would you let me be mentored by this guy someday? I'm thinking he's in Montana at that time. So as it turns out, he wasn't in Montana and uh, he was in Texas. Well, kind of fast forward. I got married June 5th, 2004. That's how long I've been married. I have four kids. Side note. Um, <laughs> he's just flexing. Like, but, honey, if you're watching, I didn't I don't know if that's that a flex. A I'm just giving but information. I do remember the exact yeah. day that we got like, married. What, how is that a flex? Like, oh, I have four kids. I mean, I guess. I mean, I, my, you have every right to flex with four kids. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> well done. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so got I uh, got married. I moved back to the Dallas Fort Worth area. Still didn't know Jack Deere had a church in this area, but come to find out, he did. And um. Long story short, I joined his church. He hired me on his staff, and uh, a mentorship developed. He began to teach me, I mean, all the Bible theology side, exegetical side, uh, but as well as, I mean, it, it was a life mentorship and life and friendship with God and everything, but uh, but also the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Wellspring Church is where I learned how to prophesy, where I learned how to pray for healing. And uh, Jack took me all around the world, uh, multiple continents and countries and uh, states, of course, and uh, doing prophetic ministry, training for prophetic ministry, answering people's questions about it. Uh, I, at one point, oversaw the prophetic ministry in our church. I'm now a senior pastor, took over uh, from Jack's church uh, in 2012. So I've actually been a pastor at Wellspring since 2004. I guess five, and um, I was just a dude going to church at, in 2004. But uh, anyway, so that's that's about that's my story. That's how I got into it, and uh, we're a church that continues to practice the gifts today uh, and train for them. So that's that's what we do, and we feel like God's put it on our heart to try to be an example church for how can you uh, practice the gifts of the Holy Spirit in a way uh, that is biblical, biblically responsible. Uh, but also ob- in terms of orderliness, but also um, not just responsible as in like we put on that seatbelt tight, but but also like in a in passionate pursuit of power. How do we marry those together? And so uh, we're trying to do those the best that we can. Do you think your experience as far as like m- most people that I hear that have had one of those experiences, they pendulum so, so far. 
right? And they go they go from the cessationist to crazy charismatic, or from crazy charismatic to hard, hard, hard cessationist. And usually it's it's the latter rather than the former. Um, do you think that having had your foot in both worlds, um, like what? Do you, do you think you have a unique perspective in that you actually held both of those positions? Well, yeah, I mean, if there, really if there was a pendulum, room. it was my kind of high school to college experience in terms yeah. of, uh, you know, going to a cessationist church. But you were never in the charismania. Uh, just, yeah, just, just that, to know just like when it. I got saved and for a year, for a year I was in it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, for that full year I was in it. And, and they were actually, they loved Jesus and they were growing with Jesus and, um, you know, really, the only things that were really particularly charismania for them were uh, their practice of the gifts of tongues and um, probably an overemphasis on being slain in the spirit. I believe people can be slain in the spirit. I have no problem with God can knock down whoever he wants to. Um, sure. <laughs> but uh, but as far as like, you know, um, every Sunday, come on up and when get you, tapped. On, it wasn't every Sunday, but it was when you went cessationist. Did you like? Did you always view them? Hey, these are Christian brothers, but I just don't believe in that stuff anymore. Like how, how did you swing? Like what was, your, how did you process their position, their practice? Yeah. Uh, I, I really never went full on cessationist more like a, it was more like a functional cessationist and happy to be not where gifts, those gifts are practiced because I didn't, uh, I just thought the only alternative was charismatic crazy. Mm. And if that was the only alternative, I'd rather go deep in the Bible. Really. And I see, I see lots of that. Like when we look at the videos of people on YouTube, when they talk about people that are crazy or they talk about charismatics, they always use the most extreme, um, excessive, no boundaries, no, no spiritual airbag, nothing charismania. Uh -huh. And they use that as like all charismatics are like this, right? They create this really yes, nuts category. Absolutely. Um, th that's it's a total straw man. Yeah, yeah. Having been in it, you're, that was your only perception as well. Right. Yeah. So, that, that was my perception. So that's what I went with. But, but you know, and, and again, to my cessation as brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, that's why you don't, You'll hear me saying things like, I believe cessationism is wrong, and sure. I believe that it's even uh, dangerous, like as in um, any anything that I believe is unbiblical uh, and even goes against the Bible. Yes, I believe it's dangerous. I believe it's harmful. Uh, however, um, you're not going to hear me bashing cessationists uh, right. because I have found my biblical and theological foundation in a cessationist church, and I have a deep affection for that. I only bring it up to say that like... Uh, it's it's it justifies people who believe that the charismatic movement is a monolith. It right. justifies because if you can come, you can be in it and think that is what charismatics are without having done extensive amounts of research. That was your only experience. So that's what you thought they were. Right. It's very possible that a lot of these guys on YouTube that are making these yeah. videos that are only looking at the extreme. It's possible they haven't done the research to look at what does theological safety look like when practicing these gifts as well. Absolutely. Only to say that it's possible they're not setting up a straw man, you know, uh, that they are probably unintentionally yeah. categorizing everyone monolithically. Yeah. And but I think also, even to be fair, I, I do think that uh, too many charismatic churches are too crazy. <laughs> that, that is also fair. Yeah. Right. Like, uh, I, I wish there were more charismatic churches that were like, uh, okay, this Sunday we're going to be at Romans chapter one and we're going to, you know, and talk through it exegetically and really exposit the scripture, you know, those kind of things. Uh, cause I, I do think that it is overly common in charismatic <laughs> churches to, um, e even if they're not out of order with people screaming in tongues at the top of their lungs, that's one side of charismatic chaos. The the other side is um, is is just not like a, a a deep reverence for God's word that manifests itself in the way God's word is treated in the preaching, mm -hmm. uh, such that um, I have a revelation about this verse and here's what I here's what it means, or um, I uh, you know just kind of hopping from verse to but, here, verse to there, and it's and it's not real expositing the scripture. Now to be fair. Lots of cessationist churches do that too. It's sure. not just a charismatic issue. Uh, Miller, you were about to say something. From, from what I, yeah, well, I, I think the, uh, as time has gone by, so I talked to several good friends of mine that were in the charismatic movement uh, much earlier on here in the in the West. And they'd, they'd say today's church, or at least the charismatic movement today is not what it was, you know, 30, 40 years ago. 
Um, whereas back then, it actually was quite common that you would hear them going through a book of the Bible at a time, expositing an entire book and doing proper exegesis. Whereas today, it's it's almost only topical sermons or a series that's topical, um, where you're just sort of you know cherry picking scriptures to defend whatever it is that you're teaching, uh, or um, teaching some sort of revelatory thing which would have never uh, existed at that time. So it, it has, in some sense, it's gotten worse, and, it, and it's getting, as far as uh, what's common um, or more popular, it's that topical or uh, revelatory type teaching. So, Miller, yeah. tell us a little bit about your background, man. Um, I think people are also interested. I know we've we've done some stuff. People are really familiar with uh, some of you and your background, but uh, give us some, some kind of background of who you are, how you came into the gifts, um, man, sure. probably even some of that pendulum conversation as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, Roundtree and I have a similar journey in some regards. Actually, one testimony will be the exact same, which is kind of, uh, I mean, it really is, it's a divine orchestration of events, um, even how he and I became friends. So uh, my family, I, I didn't grow up in a Christian home, um, Jewish mother, Mormon father, um, very confusing upbringing. Uh, I would have said I was an atheist in middle school. And then when I was in the 10th grade, a buddy of mine that I used to go out and party with, uh, he came back from a choir trip having become a Christian and he gave me a Bible. It was one of those Bibles that had the, the New Testament and just the Psalms and the Proverbs. And that was really the beginning of my walk with Christ. It wasn't in a church. Um, it was starting off by waiting till my family went to bed and then I would get out my Bible that I had hidden in my desk and I would start reading. Um, and I would just read Matthew and I thought, I, I want to be like this guy. I liked what Jesus said. I, I thought it was polar opposite of every way of life that I knew, um, which by the way, is the mic, am I speaking to the mic well enough? You guys hear it all right? Fine. You guys can, let me know you, you, can you guys hear okay, uh, Michael Miller well? Someone in the chat says your voice sounds like chocolate milk. So I think you're fine. <laughs> okay. That's exactly that's the first. That's exactly what I thought. Well, hello there, whoever that is. <laughs> uh so, Disgusting, bro. I, it's so gross. <laughs> so anyway, I when I was 16, I, I got plugged into a Bible church, which was where all of my best friends went to church. I used to crash at my buddy's house on Saturday night just because I knew he went to church on Sunday morning and I wanted to go. And so it was a um, Bible church in Dallas, Texas. Uh, the pastors were all Dallas Theological Seminary grads, the youth pastors, Dallas Theological Seminary grad. Uh, so very much a cessationist church. And I can actually recall being 16 and hearing the new youth pastor talk about how uh, if anybody speaks in tongues or is prophesying, they're actually doing against going against the scriptures because we're told that nothing should change in scripture. And he quoted that passage about how, uh, what is it, not a not a jot or a tittle should be added into these until everything's fulfilled. And he's like, if anybody's speaking in tongues or if anybody's prophesying that they're actually adding or changing the scriptures. Um, and so that's what I thought from age 16. My, my introduction into Christendom was really early taught that these things were not for today. So I had no exposure to uh, charismatic Christianity. And then I went off to college. Uh, my first semester was in Greeley, Colorado, at University of Northern Colorado. And there was a girl in my dormitory that I was getting to know um, and found out that she spoke in tongues. And when she told me that, I was like, well, that's got to be demonic. Because in the back of my head, I remember what my, my youth pastor had said. And so um, that, I mean, that friendship just quickly ended because I think she felt really rejected by me. Um, and so I didn't think about it again. I, I ended up transferring to Texas A&M, did uh, Young Life. And then my senior year, or just going into my senior year of college, um, I started questioning some of the methodology. Um, specifically, if, you know, I would read the scriptures like, you know, in Acts where it says, and 3,000 came to believe in him in one day. Uh, or, I mean, there's a number of towns, the entire town of Joppa, you know, comes to Christ. Like you, you read these things and you're like, why doesn't that happen at the high school where I'm doing Young Life? Um, you know, there, I was doing Young Life at Bryan High School, probably 4,000 students go there. And I'm thinking, well, why can't a healing happen here that would cause that kind of thing to take place? And so um, uh, one of my buddies from high school, one of my best friends, he had gone on a Young Life retreat and it told me the story, it told me a story about a girl in, the, in uh, on his Young Life team who had uh, had an issue um, similar to the woman you read about in scripture, the, one, the woman with the issue of blood, and how he prayed for her 
and he said that he his knees were shaking, like they were knocking. He, there was power going through him, and that she was healed. And now I knew who the girl was, and because I had I had worked at the Young Life camp with her, and so my buddy, his name was Joe, he was telling me the story, and I was like, man, I don't I don't believe you. There is no way that that happened. And so I said, give me her number. I'm going to call her, and I want to hear her side of it. And so I called her up and said, hey, Kate, you know, this is Michael. It's been a long time. Uh, I, I had heard the story from Joe. Can you tell me what happened? And she goes on to tell me how she'd had this issue, how Joe had prayed for her and that and how she hadn't been able to sleep during all of this time um, and how that night she was able to sleep and that the issue of blood stopped. But then the problem actually came back later. And so I didn't know what to do with that. That was sort of a uh, throwing a monkey wrench at both my worldview and my theology. So fast forward, um, I start reading, uh, I, you know, and this was sort of normal for me to go through in my devotional time, go through a book of the Bible at a time. And so I'm reading through the book of John and I get to John chapter nine, where Jesus and his disciples have, uh, are, are walking down a road and they see a man who's born blind. And the disciples ask him, uh, is this man born blind because of his sin or his parents' sin? And Jesus, his response was, well, it's neither this man of sin nor his parents, but let the work of God be displayed. And then he heals the man's eyes. And he says, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day for a night is coming when the work will cease. Now, when I read that, I thought, well, that's a, that's a really strange thing to say. We must work the works of God. I was like, well, maybe he's just talking about the disciples. Well, Am I not also a disciple? Should I not also be doing exactly what they're doing? Have I not given myself over to following in, uh, the teachings of Jesus and doing what Jesus did, uh, the work of the gospel? Um, then I'm like, well, maybe maybe the work of God is is something different. Maybe it's just evangelism. But then he displays the work of God by healing a blind man. And then he'll take it even a step further in the next chapter in John 10, 37. And he'll say, don't believe me unless I do the works. Um and this is in response to the Pharisees who are up in arms about a blind man being healed. And so um, this was sort of a crossroads for me. I was now being confronted with a, a testimony of a healing or I guess a, a healing that was reversed. And then uh, the scriptures themselves confronting what I know to be true. And so I decided that I was going to start praying. Every time I prayed, I would pray these specific words. Uh, God, I want to experience your power so I can know whether or not it's for today. And so I would literally pray that every single time I prayed. And, it, and it, it, even awkwardly so, like when you know, you're having a meal with a bunch of friends and you pray before the meal. Well, if I prayed, I would throw in those words because that was my commitment. I'm going to pray those words every single time I pray, even if it's with other people. Uh, now, my expectation of how God would answer that prayer was that he would either show me in the scriptures that he wasn't doing miracles today or that he would let me see some sort of healing or miracle that would be uh, beyond um, uh, explanation um, so that I couldn't explain it away. What happened was something different. Um, uh, one morning I'm praying with a buddy of mine. His name is Drew. Uh, he's now a pastor at a good old Bible church in Texas. Um, and there's a whole lot of details I'm leaving out just for the sake of time, but uh I am praying with him at six in the morning on a Friday morning and he comes over and he puts his hands on my back and he starts praying. Now, I didn't know he was going to do that. Didn't ask him to do that. Didn't know what that was even about. Uh, but when he, when his hand touched my back, I began crying and shaking and, uh, the kind of crying where it's at first, it was just a little bit of a whimper, but, uh, things started progressing to where I was literally wailing at the top of my lungs. Um, and I remember in like my thought process was, this is strange. Why are you crying? Uh, you don't need to be crying. There's nothing to be upset about. And, and so in my head, everything was rather rational. Um, but my ex experience, what was happening viscerally in my body was something entirely different. And then when I started wailing at the top of my lungs, I was thinking, you really should stop this. You're going to wake up his roommates. Um, are you guys there? I don't know if I, I can't even hear you guys at all. So yeah, we're here. We're here. Yeah, okay. Okay. I mute my microphone so that... If I cough. I, well, sure. I guess what I was going to ask you, Michael, was this behavior unusual for you? Yeah, yeah. I know. I, I obviously it was unusual. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> he's, being, he's, being a Messing with me. he's like, you know, I, I vaguely remember you screaming at the top of your lungs every other night. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> all right, all right. Okay, so you're right. you're wailing. It's like six something in the morning. There are roommates in the room. You're wishing you could stop, but you're like literally having conscious thoughts about possibly stopping, but you're still just wailing and something spiritual yeah. is happening. Yeah, that was the thing. I wasn't in control of the crying. I wasn't in control of the trembling. I mean, I was literally trembling. Like, I don't know how to, to, to show you, but... Um, and then uh, at some point in that, and I don't know how long this experience went on. I don't know if it was 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, but I remember it was like, uh, you know, like you take a sip of, co uh, a sip of coffee on a cold day and you feel that warmth go down your esophagus. Well, that's kind of what I was feeling, but it was going through every part of my being, like even into my fingertips. And um, little by little, the sensation sort of went away and I could, and I stopped crying, kind of came to, and I get up and, and I asked my buddy, what was that? And he says, I, I don't know. Uh, he had no idea what was going on. Um, now I'm leaving some details out because there's more to this story, but I think I could share this at a later time. But, uh, my buddy who prayed for me, he just felt like God said, put your hand on them and pray. And he did. Um, now he was a good old Baptist boy. He, he wasn't accustomed, didn't know much about the gifts, wasn't accustomed to charismatic practices. He wasn't so this was all the just sort anointing. Of, yeah. <laughs> we didn't use the word anointing. Uh, that was not a part of a vocabulary. <laughs> so uh, but I remember over the next several weeks, anytime I would sit down to pray or read my Bible, I would feel that presence come on me and I'd begin to tremble. Um, never quite as strong and it slowly sort of dissipated and, and it stopped happening after a couple of weeks. Um, but that was kind of my first experience. You know, it was Michael, exactly what ask, I prayed for. Do you think that this was... Um... Because pe some people are hearing this, they're, they're, they're hearing uncontrollable, wailing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're going to say, man, this kind of sounds like demonic. I mean, I'll just ask you the question straight up. Do you feel like there was deliverance that was taking place in that moment? I mean, it seems as if you're saying there, the power of God was present for sure. Um, yeah. But do you think that that was causing something to come out? Do you think that was the I, presence I do, of God going I do think in? I, I think it was a both end. Um, something I didn't say was that I was also dry heaving uh, okay. when that was happening. Uh, but again, in my head, completely rational. It was all like, why are you doing this? Um, so I do think there was some deliverance taking place. Um, you know, I, I would say that I had struggled with depression uh, for most of my life up until that time. And after that, you know, depression was not not the same. Now, there was circumstantial depression that I've had later on, but not an overall pervasive long-term sense of depression so you'd say that so you, like it, it was so accompanied you're, by you're some telling us deliverance. that in that moment uh, a lifelong at least maybe kind of from teenage years onward struggle with depression uh was eliminated in that moment yeah and i wouldn't say it was extreme depression i would just say it was sort of this lingering hopelessness is yeah. this all there is to life um and after that, I would say that that changed. And yeah. I would also say that it was like uh, after that experience. So I, I had prayed to experience the power of God, and that's what I experienced. Um, yeah. Hey, and I just the, want to interrupt really quick, too, because I also want to recognize uh, for our viewers who are uh, they're watching and they're, you know, maybe they have like clinical depression or whatever. Michael, you're definitely not saying like, hey, everybody that's, uh, you know, has clinical depression has a demon also or something like that. You're no, simply sharing no. your own experience that you were given to despair as a way of life, maybe not to the most extreme degrees, but kind of um, to some degree, and you experienced a deliverance when a friend laid his hand upon you and unexpectedly uh, you had a, an experience of being what you believe delivered from demonic a demonic spirit that was accompanied by physical manifestations. And now you were about yeah. to go into life transformation from there. Well, let me be clear about something. I don't know if my assessment of everything that took place is accurate. Um, to my best of my ability that's kind of what i think was happening um when it comes to depression you know since then i've had bouts of depression that were largely circumstantial and i've even gone on medication for you know a three-month stint while i was trying to get sort of reset and and back on top of my emotions um so it's not like i'm opposed to those things it's not like i think every case of depression is demonic um 
yeah, I, I would say that that was sort of a unique experience in my life where I went from a place of having sort of this pervasive sense of hopelessness to that not being the case. And if anything, the after effects uh, after I had that experience was um, I started reading my Bible with a brand new pair of eyes. Uh, it was like the scriptures suddenly were opened in a way they hadn't been before. Whereas before I would have read about a healing and just thought, wow, that's really cool. Um, you know, Jesus doing a miracle. Today, I was, you know, at, well, from that moment on, I was reading it and going, gosh, well, is that what that looks like to pray for the sick? Do we have to, do we have to spit in some dirt and rub it on a man's eyes if we want to see a blind man get healed? Uh, you know, like you, you start reading the scriptures differently when suddenly you think, well, that's for today. Those, should, those things should be happening today. Um, so the result was um, an increased passion for the scriptures. Uh, an increased passion to see God's kingdom advanced. All of a sudden, I started fasting regularly for my, you know, to, and praying regularly for the students at the at the school where I did Young Life. Um, and, and again, I, I would just say that was the results of that experience. I felt like God had kind of showed me a bit of Himself, and that left me hungrier for more. Does that help? You're you're muted. There you go. Okay. There you go. So uh, here's a question from Lewis on the show. He says, how does someone who's init who is initially introduced to faith through the charismatic and Pentecostal church, but then becomes aware of the issues you talk about on your shows, reconcile their faith? Does that question make sense for you, Michael? Well, not exactly. Uh, I d depends what you mean. Like, which issues are you referring to? And uh, I mean, because I, I think I, I can probably help with reconciling the faith because yeah, I'm so basically, you know, um, believer. how does somebody work through charismatic crazy? Oh, um, gosh, that's, I mean, it just depends what the craziness is. I think that the big thing to recognize is that uh, your practice of certain things does not always mean it's scriptural. Um, but I would say that's true with not just the gifts, with anything. And the other thing is, I do not think gifts are given in accordance to a person's character or their theology or their practice, their orthopraxy. Um, it, it, God so sovereignly gives gifts away, but that doesn't predetermine how you're going to use those gifts. And the same, I mean, we, and we know this in, in, instinctively with the gift of teaching, right? We know that there are people who have a gift of teaching, and sometimes they teach doctrine that's not true. Now, it may not be intentional, uh, it may be unintentional, but it still happens. In the same way, I think that with gifts of the Spirit, you can have gifts, other gifts outside of teaching being used and uh, or misused, and some even manipulatively so, and I would call that abuse. So um, one thing, Michael, I didn't mention was after that, uh, having prayed the same thing you had prayed, uh, someone gave me Jack Deere's book. I just left college, taking a full-time job with Young Life in Dallas. Uh, read that book and it was like finally somebody could speak my language. I'd had this charismatic experience, um, was an evangelical, uh, big, big appreciation for, for doctrine, uh, memorizing scripture, uh, praying regularly, the disciplines. I remember Richard Foster's Celebration of Discipline was a, was a uh, formative book for me, um, but nobody could explain to me the gifts in a, in a way that I could receive what they had to say about it. All I had was an experience. So when I read Jack's book, that book spoke my language. And so I thought he lived in Montana when I read the book. I started praying, uh, God, would you please let me be discipled by someone like Jack Deere? Little did I know that he was pastoring a church where Michael Roundtree had just taken the youth pastor position. Uh, and I started commuting out there from Dallas. Um, and the next thing I know, I'm in the same boat as Michael uh, being discipled by Jack and traveling with him and growing in the gifts and um, I think, you know, during my stint there, I helped out with the youth under Michael's leadership and then uh, uh, ended up overseeing the healing prayer ministry for a time and led a men's group. And so that was kind of that. Awesome. You have any questions for him, jo Josh? Um, Josh, did you know that about both Michael and I, that we had actually prayed that same prayer to be discipled by someone like Jack Deere? No, I hadn't. I actually feel a little left out. I, I want to like sneak it into my uh, testimony. You should have never. And I you prayed. Should, you should have prayed. Lord, let me dis be discipled by someone like Jack Deere. Hey, and God never you, answered my prayer. You know what, though? I, w <laughs> I will say that when it comes to experiencing the gifts of the Holy Spirit, I mean, um, when Paul says eagerly desire spiritual gifts, he's not just saying sit there and hope you get them. 
right? Yeah. Like um, there was prayer involved. For me, it was deep scriptural study, reading books, and, and as well as praying for what I wanted to see. And I didn't even mention prayers for actually seeing the supernatural, which we could tell long stories about. Uh, same thing with you, Michael. I see that pattern in your life, praying for that experience with Jack, that you could get a mentor in these things. That's huge. Uh, but yeah. also praying for an experience uh, that uh, an experience with the Holy Spirit such as that. And and I just think that is huge and, uh, and overlooked because uh, I, I think this is where the open but cautious is just not going to experience anything. Because if I'm kind of sitting on my heels with like arms crossed being like, knock me over, God. You're like, I'm just not going to experience the Holy Spirit. It's like saying, There's I'm, a, I'm open to God using me to win the loss and do evangelism, but I'm never going to talk to a lost person. Right. There's a certain posture that eagerly desire uh, spiritual gifts. Uh, it, it, the posture is one that's on your toes. Uh, I mean, when you're eager, what do you do? You're, you're moving forward. And so uh, I see that in your story, Michael, and I think that's instructive for all of us. Whatever experiences that you guys want to have, uh, if, if you want a, a, you know, God to reveal himself to you in a powerful way, if you want to be used in healing power, if you want some, yeah. somebody to mentor you in these things, if you're saying, man, I, I just wish I had a church like this, start praying for it. And, uh, and this was one thing that Jack Deere used to say all the, t all the time. He used to say, uh, you can have anything that you're willing to labor and prayer for. And I've found that to be true in my life. And uh, it's what will you labor in prayer for every single day. And um, so that's a powerful story, Michael. Yeah, it's uh, uh, interesting to see the trajectory that God had both you and I on because both of us were, were yes, definitely eagerly desiring those things. I mean, I literally would pray for those. It was all the time for me. Um, but then I, what I also didn't expect God to do was to, uh, yes, he gave me a mentor that could show us and teach us about these things in a way that was uh, helpful and biblically. We could point our finger in scripture and go, hey, that's where that is. Uh, but then also he gave us, really unique friendships that allowed us to pursue these things together, which was probably crucial, I think, for both you and I, um, because we would we would push each other out of the boat. That was sort of a, a you know, five, six year thing for us to challenge each other and constantly be sharing stories and pushing each other further. So. Awesome. OK, Josh, tell us your story, bud. Uh, OK. Uh yeah, so uh, I, I shock you right I'm there. I'm very different than the, than these you're, guys. You were in the YouTube chat, weren't you? I was. You're, you're deep lost in uh, YouTube chat. Lost, lost in the the, the ether webs there. Um, no, I, I'm I'm very different than both Michael and Michael in that I, uh, my name is not Michael. I was not discipled by Jack Deere, and I was not a cessationist <laughs> at any point in time in my life. Um, uh, so I was raised in the Assemblies of God, um, the church that I grew up in. Uh, I want to say around at the age of 12, I, I think I might might be predating that early. I might have been er, late, uh, older. Um, anyway, uh, the church that I grew up when the pastor was kind of like embezzling money from the church and uh, it didn't go well, but the very next church that I went to through most of my teen years uh, was a church called Heartland World Ministries Church. Um, this church was pastored by a man by the name of Steve Hill. Uh, if anyone in the comment section is assemblies or is anyone familiar with Pentecostal, um, I guess, uh, Ism. speakers, the Pentecostal uh, uh, circuit, uh, they'll know Steve as the guy who preached on 1995 Father's Day in Pensacola, Florida, um, and revival broke out, right? So uh, the Brownsville revival was uh, a revival that Steve Hill showed up uh, at a service that John Kilpatrick was hosting, um, and that service didn't stop for five years. So from 95 to um, uh, 2010, uh, no, 2000, yeah, so 95 to 2000 even, uh, for five years, uh, the Brownsville Revival uh, in Pensacola, Florida uh, was raging on. There was lines outside of the church. Uh, people were being uh, they, they were they flocking to the church. They were bringing lost people. They were seeing displays of power. Uh, one of the things that was very common uh, was being slain in the spirit. There was a very high emphasis placed on um, initial physical evidence, which was popular in the assemblies, uh, that you aren't filled with the spirit until you speak in tongues. And this was kind of the culture I was raised in. Because in 2000, Steve moved from Pensacola to Irving, Texas, planted a church in Las Colinas at the time, and then later moved it to Irving. 
Um, and that's the church that I grew up in, Heartland. So uh, my background is classical Pentecostal second blessing um, kind of theology. And the way that that worked in me was that it was uh, a bit of a, uh, a guilt trip that I wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, the kind of uh, the language of haves and have nots, like God has empowered you to do ministry, but he hasn't empowered you to do ministry, uh, was something that I think bothered me for a long time because uh, we were in public high school. What does that even mean that he has, but he hasn't? Right. So he's he's in, he's empowered some people to do ministry and hasn't empowered others to do ministry. Oh, okay. So I was yeah. doing You were among the have nots. I was among the have nots, right. So Because you, you weren't a tongue speaker yet. Right. Right. Yeah. So I was uh, 17 in their Bible school, um, not speaking in tongues, having, having no uh, charismatic experience that was uh, personally that I had experienced. I'd seen others who had s- healings. They would speak in tongues, prophecy. Uh, of course, I can also say that every prophetic word that I had ever witnessed all the way through my teen years and probably into my 20s uh, was either wrong or uh, so vague it couldn't be judged. So that was one of the... Um, uh, the really odd things when I started hanging out with you and Michael is I was seeing prophetic words for the first time in my entire life that were uh, both accurate and discernible. Like you could judge them. Well, true. First time. Say that again. That was, he said that was, well, I didn't that realize was really that. your that first, was first time. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd say so. I mean, I, I grew up around lots of prophetic voices, but all the prophetic words were always like, God's going to do a new thing and behold, the Lord's going to touch your church and this next thing is going to happen. And like uh, I, being in Steve Hill's church, I can't, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that the third great awakening and uh, the Isaiah 35 prophecy that God was going to up highway 35 blaze revival. And uh, all these churches were going to get saved. Oh, and it was gonna, I mean, I, I heard nothing but stuff that didn't. Yeah. Happen. Sometime we yeah. need to do a show about like revival culture. Yeah. Uh, cause I, I think that sometimes that can be exhausting to people. It's, it was exhausting. It was a lot of burnout. And as a guy who believed in this stuff, um, it was, it was difficult cause I was in public high schools doing evangelism, um, you know, leading 90 to 300 kids in a given week in public high schools, like leading them in evangelism, leading them in Bible studies, leading them uh, in different outreach programs. So we've got people who are on the mission field today. We've got friends of mine who are, um, uh, uh, they've gone through seminary, they've got master's degrees, uh, uh, which I don't have, oddly enough. But I've, I've, I was able to lead a lot of people to Christ who have gone on to do great things, but I wasn't empowered for ministry. And that was like, that was bothersome that this guy over here is speaking in tongues. He's bound in sin. He's, you know, uh, he, he's were got people no like, character. Were people coaching you? Were they like, repeat oh, yeah. after me, shoebosh, robo, lobo? Yeah, but I wouldn't do that stuff. Like I couldn't. Like, but they would try to get you to. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I was, it was a, a pretty common thing for people to say, Hey, you've got to get out of your head. And I'd come up to the altars and they'd pray for me and I wouldn't fall over. <laughs> they would just keep saying, receive it. No, no, you got to receive like the Lord's got to teach you to receive. And they would just like kind of sway you. <laughs> and then would they, you ever fall explain, over. would they ever explain how to receive? <laughs> it well, it drives me crazy. It was <laughs> so Michael's experience this. So it was basically like fall over, right? Like, because the thing is, is, is there, there was probably more than anything kind of a psychosomatic um, like they would even say it from, Hey, uh, later on in this service, come forward. I'm going to lay my hands on you and the power of God is going to touch you. And some people are going to fall over and some people are going to shake. And they're, they're basically coaching you through what was going to happen when the spirit of the Lord came on you. Mm-hmm. So some people would feel the Lord and then just do the thing that the minister said that was going to happen. Um, so, but I wasn't interested in any of that. I was, I, w- I wanted an authentic touch from the Lord and I was going to keep going up to altar calls. I was going to keep having people lay hands on me. I was going to keep getting prayer yeah. until the Lord did something authentic um, but also during this time, I was cultivating a pretty serious prayer life. Um, you know, I, uh, we, they had opened up the, the Bible school at like 9 a.m., I think. So some 9 to 10, we'd have chapel. And we started showing up at 8 and then 7 and then 6 and then 5. And I was getting people to give me codes so I could get into the church to pray at 4 a.m. Um, and I'd go up there and pray for five or six hours before school started. Um, and I was pursuing the Lord. I was asking for... Okay, how's that for a flex, by the way? I'm like, I have four kids, and you're like, flex. I and then you're like, I prayed for 30 hours a day. Well, uh, <laughs> I think that's possible. 30 hours a week, maybe. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but seriously, though, when, when you're told that you don't have the Holy Spirit because you don't speak in tongues. You're going to um, labor. You, you pray until you get the ghost. Um, and that's what I did. They told me that's how you get it. Um, and eventually, I did, in fact, begin to speak in tongues. Um, and there was certainly a nearness with the Lord that was cultivated in a time of prayer. But I can tell you that before I spoke in tongues, I felt a nearness to the Lord. And after I spoke in tongues, I felt a nearness to the Lord. And the gift was just a gift. It wasn't a, 
a sign or symbol of anything that uh, the Lord was doing in me or through me. Um, it was just a gift um, to build me up. So uh, I don't know, man. Uh, my experience with uh, the Pentecostal charismatic gifts was pro- w- even in that moment, I didn't realize uh, that that we were off kilter in any way. So, um, you know, I went and did evangel. I went and uh, youth pastored, had some pretty crazy experiences um, that would put a lot of the the fringe charismatics, I think, um, I, I would, it would place me in that camp because I've, I've had some pretty um, odd experiences. And then, uh, man, coming back to Texas, we did evangelism. Uh, God would continue to use me. Uh, you know, I, I saw a couple of sick people get healed. Um, never really saw any accurate prophetic words probably for another three or four years. But yeah, my, my background's very, very different than yours. And then I was looking for theological answers in a very uh, passionate space instead of being in a very theological space and looking for those kind of passionate experiences. Uh, it, we've landed in the same place, but we came from very different uh, different starting points, I think. Okay. Yeah. Young Shepherd says, give us one experience, Josh. Um, I don't like sharing these. Maybe uh, that time when your head did a 360 uh, and oh spun yeah. around. And I like puking. And you prayed 30 no, straight hours exercise. in a day. <laughs> Um, so we would, we would have these moments where we would do, uh, early morning prayer and, and I, we would go do prayer and I came back and, um, so I had a prayer room in uh, this double wide trailer that I lived in as a youth pastor. Um, one experience that I had, um, is I, I laid, laid in, well, I guess if I'm anyway, sorry, I, I don't like sharing these stories. So it's kind of weird. Um, uh, one encounter I'm laying in bed, I'm, I'm looking at the foot of my bed and there is an angel. Right. Mm-hmm. I wake up. There's an angel at the foot of my bed. Um, uh, it, it, it's glowing with light. Um, I don't see any wings. It looks like if you would imagine a mannequin with no facial features and it was just muscle tissue um, mm-hmm. covering his face, covering his arms, just muscle tissue. And out of every vein of muscle tissue was emitting light. It was very brilliant. It was very mm-hmm. bright. Uh, I'm looking down at this creature and I'm kind of I'm baffled. Um, And I begin to look at his face and I see that the face of this angel is glowing with the brilliance of the sun. And I think, wow, Jesus glows with the brilliance of the sun in Revelation. It says his face shines like the sun. Um, Maybe this is Jesus. And as I, that thought goes through my head, I hear um, the voice of God in a very audible sense. Um, The the Lord, I've audibly spoke probably the two times in my entire life I've heard God. Um, I heard him say, uh, angel, uh, angels of darkness portraying themselves as angels of light. And I turned to my left and I saw my wife in bed who was being tormented. Um, and if anyone who's seen a demonic spirit torment someone, you know exactly what it looks like. Um, and I freak out that I'm being deceived that, that, that in a moment where I think, man, God is giving me access to a super awesome, really cool experience. The Lord is just kind of slapping me upside the head, showing how easily I am deceived by supernatural experiences and how willing I am to assume all of them are God. Um, and I snap out of this trance, if you will, because I'm laying in bed in the exact same place and I'm having this vision. So it's kind of hard to tell whether I was a man awake or sleeping. I know not. Um, but I was present. Um, I saw this angelic being. My wife wasn't being tormented when I came to. Um, yeah, that's that's a weird experience. Is that is that good? Yeah. Yeah, that's Commenter good. The, the Pentecostals, the Pentecostals in the crowd, I think, are happy with it. So, okay. <laughs> um, that's a uh, hold on. I want to I want to talk about that for a second because that's an interesting <laughs> experience. Like, it seems like on some level, uh, you know, I, obviously God allows these things to happen, right? So it's not yeah. like this was outside of his his permission or something like that. But uh, uh, it, what's what I find interesting about this is, in some sense, it was God shaking you and waking you up to the fact that you can easily be deceived um, by seeing something really cool and miraculous. That's right. And so I would imagine just based on knowing you, Josh, that this is also part of the reason why there's a level of skepticism that you've brought to certain testimonies and experiences. Well, I mean, even when I asked you the question, like, hey, Michael, you shook violently and screamed, or I said violently, I'm actually putting words in your mouth now, Uh, but there's some kind of um, physical manifestation that you're not in control of. Um, That sounds like things that I read in the Bible about demonic forces. What do you think? And the reason I asked it is I submitted it because I don't, you would know having had the experience, whether this was the Lord or not the Lord, 
and and I wanted to know what your thoughts were on it um, because we have these kinds of experiences that are transformative and we still have to weigh them we still have to judge them sure. we still have to test the spirits as as commanded to us in scripture um, and I think that this was just one of the moments where the Lord was trying to wake me up to say hey obviously there's supernatural things happening I just gave you a vision right um, but also not every supernatural experience is from God um, and that I mean that that is a profound thing for people who are like, hey, the gifts of the spirit, if you believe in those, you're just going to like, you're, you're just going to go off into easy believism and crazy Pentecostal world. It's actually believing in the gifts and a gift of the spirit that caused me to be more reserved about the gifts of the spirit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think that's why God speaks to his people is because he wants to direct them and guide them and yeah. lead them. Um, and I was open to that. Awesome. Well, hey, uh, we're kind of coming up on an hour here, and I thought it might be good for each of us to go around and maybe share a summary thought that's uh, maybe in the way of like guidance toward those. It, it could be toward those who uh, come from a background where they're afraid of charismatic craziness. It could be for those who are coming from a background of they actually want to experience more of the Holy Spirit, not necessarily the craziness, but just the Holy Spirit. And uh, but just kind of putting both of those together into a single nutshell, like what would be your exhortation to people uh, who want to experience more of that, but more in an orderly biblical way? Um, Michael, why don't you go first? Sure. Um you know, one of the things that, that was a struggle for me when I started to embrace these gifts is that I would go to these Pentecostal churches, charismatic churches, and the sense I got was that I had to check my head at the door. And um, and I remember even hearing a teaching where it's where the, the pastor said, you know, you're supposed to be spirit led, not mind led. And uh, I actually feel like that's a very damaging way to approach things because it, it, it sets those two things up in a false or as in as though they're in opposition to one another and being spirit led does not mean you check your head at the door the holy spirit can use your mind those two things are not in contradiction to one another and so my encouragement would be to seek the holy spirit out with all of these things use your mind um you know one of the the verses of scripture when it came to pursuing this stuff that i would uh sort of remind myself of was out of matthew 7 and luke 11 um where he says, ask, seek, knock. And uh, I remember reading Tozer on that particular topic and um, just this idea that I was going to pursue God with everything in me. And uh, that means I was going to listen to other teachers that might not have been from my tradition, uh, but I would still weigh what I was being said and I wouldn't throw my head out. So I would encourage you guys to do both. Seek, but don't throw your head away. Yeah, I think mine's probably in the same space as I would just say um, that the scriptures are sufficient. Um, uh, the, the scriptures are inerrant, that they are sufficient for our life, for our practice and our faith in Christ. Um, I would want people who are wanting to pursue the gifts, um, but pursue them in a safe way to realize you don't have to go to a special teacher. Um, you don't have to go to a new revelation. You don't have to go to a secret understanding that has been revealed and it's, that hasn't been seen throughout history. You can actually read the Bible um, believe the Bible. And there, there's no reason to go to, there's no reason not to go to teachers to be discipled. There's no reason not to go to people who are um, uh, experienced in the gifts, but making sure that everything lines up with scripture. I think the area that we, we get into deception and we get into error is when we are, we are seeing someone operate um, in a powerful way. Um, and then we glean from them things that are not found in scripture. Um, mm-hmm. And I would say that that is a recipe for disaster. Um, so in, in my experience, what I would encourage you to do is just um, ask God, pray, pursue these things, but understand that the scriptures are sufficient to guide us and lead us through these practices um, and to be very, very weary of anyone. Not be weary. Don't follow people who want to give you extra biblical nuggets on how to operate in the gifts. Right. Just, just don't. Yeah. Not good. Absolutely. I think the word you're looking for was leery, if I'm not mistaken, not weary. Yeah. <laughs> are you tired? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I am very tired of it. I'm tired of it, Michael. I don't want any more of the charismatic abuse. I'm weary of it. I'm done. Well, there's leery and then there's wary. I think that he mixed them. But uh, I'm anyway. all of them. I'm all of the things. I'm yeah. weary. I'm leery. I'm <laughs> awesome. I'm all the seven dwarfs. Every single one of them. Um, yeah, I think I would say is just a, a, I guess I have a few closing thoughts. I think uh, 
One is environment really matters. Michael, for you, it wasn't until you actually came to Wellspring and you left a deeply cessationist environment that you really started to grow and flourish in it. You had some experiences before that, but you really flourished then. Same thing happened to me. I mean, if you take a, a seed and you, you put that one seed in a desert and you, or if you alternatively put it in a rainforest, there's going to be a difference in how that thing flourishes and, uh, you know, kind of all things being equal. So uh, the, the point is environment matters. And if you really, really want to grow in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you need to be in a church that believes in those things. Now, uh, and not just on the surface believes in those things, but is actually pursuing those things. And if you can't find that, get a small group of people. There was a period of time when it was just me and my wife, and I was like, let's practice prophesying. It was like we knew everything about each other. So, you know, we tried our best. But, you know, where you can form a small group. My my worship leader right now was part of a church that really wasn't pursuing the stuff. He formed a, a small group of people, and they started to practice prophesying. And uh, he started reading every book by Sam Storms and by Jack Deere and by Wayne Grudem and some of these guys who, who are steeped in Bible but are also, like, really into the Word. This is what... I mean, part, seeking the gifts, it looks like all of these things. It looks like putting yourself in a certain environment. It looks like reading up on it. It looks like listening to the To Be Continued podcast. And uh, it, it looks like prayer. And I would say prayer and fasting, laboring in prayer, uh, seeking mentorship. I think all of those things come into play. And I think, an, I guess, a final thing that I would say is remember that they are called gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're not called the curses of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so you don't need to be afraid of them. They're actually a good thing. Specifically for me, uh, when it came to prophecy, because I didn't want to add to the Bible, uh, when it came to the gift of tongues, because it was just weird, okay? Uh, those things made me really hesitant when I was coming into the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, now, deep uh, study of the scripture is what really started to bring me out of it. But remember that these are not curses. These are gifts. The gift of tongues is a gift. The gift of prophecy is a gift. That means it's beneficial to your life. It means you have an experience of God's goodness uh, when you exercise that gift. According to 1 Corinthians 12, it is a manifestation of the Spirit. And, uh, you know, some people get into this like, well, I'm going to choose to be Christ-centered instead of like focused on the gifts. Well, Ephesians 4, 7 to 11, Christ purchased the gifts of the Holy Spirit. To be Christ-centered is to be Spirit-empowered. That's a false dichotomy. So don't let some sort of uh, fear stand in the way of receiving the fullness of the gifts of what God has for you. And that's great. I would just really encourage people who are watching, make sure to hit the subscribe button, like, because we're coming out with a show on the gifts of the Spirit every single week from here on out on Wednesdays. We are going to be discussing probably next week healing. Is that, Did we agree on that, guys? Healing. I think? Healing. Michael? We're talking we're about gonna, healing. We're talking about healing the sick. Yeah, the I'm shake. always down. I think uh, something else that would be good for all of you who are listening, um, a lot of you are asking questions that we're not able to get to. Just know the intention is to to produce content about this particular topic that will eventually address a lot of those questions. But uh, I highly recommend you email uh, questions to the remnant and then make sure when you do that you keep them as concise and specific as possible. Yeah, that's good. You can you can email me at uh, media at the remnant radio dot com. That's media at the remnant radio dot com. Uh, you'll be able to send me kind of any kind of questions you have there. We're going to try, I think, next week to address cessationist arguments about healing. Um, we'll, we'll kind of break that apart. Then maybe in the next week, we're going to do a teaching on healing. And the week after that, we'll talk about the charismatic excesses of healing. So we're just going to go week by week addressing healing. Then probably following after that, we'll do stuff on prophecy. We'll do stuff on uh, words of knowledge. We'll do stuff on uh, the various gifts of the Spirit, maybe apostolic gifts, prophets, pastors, teachers, the whole nine. Uh, we're going to address it all here in upcoming episodes, so make sure to like, share, subscribe. Uh, and Patreon. And Patreon. Let's let's Patreon Patreon it. is a verb. I don't know if you knew that. If you didn't know, you can Patreon it. Patreon is a but place... But what if, what if they're weary, leery, and wary of Patreoning? It's even, it's even, it's even better for Talk them. Talk them over the edge. If they're, if they're weary, leery, and what's the other one? Wary. Wary, weary, and leery, uh, we would just encourage you um, as low as five dollars a month, you can have. No, you, I can't. I can't do it. This you, is just a place where me and Michael share our thoughts about podcasts. Uh, we, we we interview people. We talk about uh, theology with them, but we try to take a neutral stance most of the time. Uh, and then we kind of off air give some of our thoughts and comments about that. You can find those on Patreon. As low as five bucks. And, a and month. it's just a way to support us because uh, it costs money to run run a ministry. That's right. Cool. So.
Mikey, thanks for coming, man. Yeah. <laughs> coming. I'm going to be here every week. <laughs> every Wednesday, 4 o'clock. So God bless you guys, and have a great week. Thanks so much for tuning in. Blessings, guys. Peace. Mazel.